first speaker didn't want an introduction. And actually, given that he's part of a team that might just be solving the mysteries of the universe, then perhaps it's really not for me to introduce somebody who is involved with a profound and historic scientific experiment, and a successful one. But we thought, hey, we talk a lot about big data in this industry. Why don't we get somebody who's been involved with finding the Higgs boson, who has to process 100 billion um, units of data in a second, and is working out the world of dark matter. Let's just think about that, just to start us off. Okay? We're not going to talk GRPs for the next few hours, but we are going to listen about the Large Hadron Collider, its impact on us. Be inspired. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a huge welcome to the Head of Resources Development from CERN, Dr. Marcus Norberg. Here he is. We got him here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We at CERN are part of a wider scientific community that would like to understand the big picture. We ask questions. We ask questions like, what's wrong with this picture? This picture is an artistic impression of light from the night sky coming from stars that form galaxies. One of the many questions that we would like to ask is, how much energy, how much mass, how much weight is there out there in the night sky? And the brightness of the light that you can see in this picture gives us an indication of that number. We also measure the way the stars rotate around the center of the galaxies. And from that, too, we can calculate what is the mass, what is the weight of the galaxy system, and thus the weight of our universe. And the surprise was mighty when we found out that these two numbers absolutely differ. They are almost orthogonal to each other. So we asked the question, why? Why are these two numbers so different? And why don't they converge? So that you understand that this is not a little problem, we know today, based on a lot of data that has been collected, this is a finding that dates back now over 20 years, we now know that uh, we can see or detect something like 3.5% of the mass energy, or the weight, if you like, of the universe. That's three and a half percent. That means to say that we don't see, we do not understand, we have little clue of what the remaining 96.5 percent is. And this is not stuff, I'd like to call it now stuff, the 96.5 percent that we don't see but we know is there. This stuff is not somewhere hidden, locked away in some distant galaxy. No, it is right here in this room. When I push my hands towards you, about a meter, we can explain 3.5% of that. And the 96.5 centimeters of that, we can't. So it's right here. What is this stuff? At CERN, we test theories. We test theories that could explain what this stuff could be. There are many theories, not just one. When you hear about the Higgs, that's kind of okay. We've done that, now we're moving on. So one of the theories that we are looking at CERN is called supersymmetry. Among friends, we call it Susie. And the joke at CERN is desperately looking for Susie. Because, thank you, because <laughs> It's very, very hard to find. And I'll come back to that in a moment, why it is very, very ha hard to find. Anyway, the theory predicts that there are additional dimensions around us, more than the ones that we are us usually accustomed to. That is the reason why we can't see this stuff. 
because it's hidden away. It's around us, but we just can't see it. The other thing that theory says is that there's actually a mirror universe around us, just, just around us here, where we exist, all of us exist, but in a heavier format. So when you look yourself in the mirror tomorrow, and if you do remember Susie, just remember the number that you see on the scaler every morning that shocks you or one's partner is actually nothing yet. There is another parallel universe around, according to this theory, that says that we're actually a lot heavier than we think we are. And that would explain where this stuff is. Now, if you follow that to its logical conclusions, the theories, which we can't measure at CERN, but the theories give us indication, there are more dimensions. There could be as many as 11 dimensions around us. And if this is the case, we could even be talking about parallel universes. Parallel universes. That means universes like this one and many, many, many others. And again, when I push my hands towards you about a meter or so, we would be traversing about 1,000 different universes. And you are in all of them, but in slightly different order something slightly different in each of the universe. So in this universe, I'm here standing, you know, telling about this stuff. And in another universe, actually, you will be standing here, and I will be sitting where you are, and I know what you are thinking. Organizers, please take this guy back where he came from. <laughs> so don't worry, that happens. The bad news for business is that in this type of a multi-universe situation, there is no free will. I don't have time to go into that, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but take my word for it. If we have a system which has parallel universes, there is no free will. So you didn't come here because you wanted to, or you didn't come here because your boss sent you, you're just here because you are here, you know. It's bound to happen in one of the many, many universes. So this is the big picture that we are trying to figure out at CERN. And the way we do it is that in simplicity, is that we accelerate particles in opposite directions and make them collide. And when these particle beams collide, they generate pictures, and we take pictures of these pictures. That's what we do. Let me try to illustrate that with a little video that we've done. So what you see here is that we first accelerate from a little accelerator. It's only a few hundred meters in diameter. And then we start to accelerate it into higher speeds, and then we shoot it into an accelerator that's still very little. It's only six kilometers in circumference. And it whirls around there for a while. These part I can see they're going in the opposite directions. And then we shoot it into the big LHC. It's 27 kilometers in circumference, and the particles go very close to the speed of light, something like 99.99999% of the speed of light, and they go around about 350 million kilometers. That's three times the distance between uh, the, the Earth and the Sun. And here you see these little buggers. They are going in large bunches like big um, galaxies. We have as many particles in a beam as, as there are galaxies in a, in a in the, uh, uh, stars in a galaxy, and here you see them coming to the detector. We call it an experiment or detector, and you see, bang, here is the collision, and this is what we take the pictures of. This is big data. This is what we call big data, and I will come back to it. So this is a big device. I'll show you some pictures of this a little bit later, but so that you capture the essence of what I'm trying to be telling you, or what Charlie wanted me to, to, to share with you, is this process of how we generate big data and remember what we are looking for. We are trying to figure out what these theories are. So what's the process? We start with a physics equation. This is Peter Higgs. You may have heard of him. He got the Nobel Prize last year for that specific equation. So he's writing his equation. And what we do, we put a lot of computing power. And when I say a lot of computing power, I mean hundreds of thousands of PCs. They are not all at CERN. They are distributed, scattered around the planet because we can't have enough computing power at CERN. It just doesn't exist. So we share this. I'll mention more about that in a moment. And then with this computing power, we actually simulate. We, we try to make the, that physics equation that you just saw, so we just try to turn it into an image. And this is the image. These, these, these lines that you see going from the collision point outwards are exactly the field equation that, that uh, Peter just wrote uh, a moment ago. So this is the process. And all the stuff that you see, I'm not, I'm not talking about 96%. I'm talking about this real stuff there. Uh, that consists of superconducting magnets and uh, semiconductor devices and a lot of uh, cable and wire and so on. I don't go into that. This is a consequence of the fact that we need that to make this picture happen. 
So technology follows from the physics equation. So then we get the engineers into the picture, and then the engineers start to design the thing. So this is one of the experiments called Atlas, and it's, uh, you know, uh, you can see the, it has you know, 3,000 kilometers of cable, 100 kilometers of pipes. It has 50 million functional components. It's twice as much as a spacecraft would have a space shuttle, five times more than a jumbo jet if you don't count the bolts and nuts and rivets and things like that. And um, it's a very delicate instrument. It's big because it's a, it's a combination of a digital camera and a microscope because it's looking at very, very small things. And as I said, it's taking photographs very, very quickly. So it's a big thing. And um, if we would use it as a telescope, but we do not use it as a telescope, but we, if we would, we could actually see a grain of sand on the planet of Neptune. So it's pretty, pretty accurate. All right. And then we build it. And this is it. This is seen. This is one of the detectors. It's seen from below to up, so it's about 47 meters long. You can't see the length here. You can see from below up. 23 meters in diameter. It weighs 7,000 tons, which is the weight of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And there's actually a guy on a cherry picker. I don't know if you can see him. I don't have a pointer, but it doesn't matter. There's a guy there. He's very, very, very small. And uh, this is the device that generates the big data. Now, let's talk about the big data. Now, when we want to find a particle, we need to... Um, these particles that we're looking for, like the Higgs or Susie, they are very, very timid creatures. They are very, very rare. They do not happen every second. Actually, they're very, very rare. So when I say something is very, very rare, I really mean it. The probability of finding the Higgs particle is something like 10 to the minus 13. So that's one divided by a number that has 13 zeros. Now, those of you who have heard the expression, it's as difficult as finding something like a needle in a haystack. So let me picture, just assume that the Higgs is a needle in a haystack. So we would have to put 100,000 haystacks and then ask you guys to find the Higgs, which is the needle there. That's, that's what we're talking about. So it's a very rare creature. So the way we can find it is that we have to generate a lot of collisions, okay? So we generate an awful lot of collisions, and then we wait. We don't wait one second or two seconds or one day. We wait for weeks. We wait for months. We wait for years. It took two years to find the Higgs. All right? So what we do, if you have a very, very small number, what you do is that you multiply with a very, very big number. And then you get numbers like two, three and a half, five, six and a half, eight, two, one, you know. And then you can do the averaging, which you used to do when you were at high school. Remember those nice days? You had to count the average, and then you count the standard deviation, which is the variation around the mean. This is what we do. It's not difficult, but we need an awful lot of data. And the data is a pain in the neck because we generate so much of it. And we're looking for something which is teeny, weeny, 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 weeny small. Okay? So, just to give you an idea that we have one big problem in the way, it would be nice to collect all this data, but we can't because the, the flow of the information is so huge. If we wanted to collect all the data that you saw in that collision a moment ago, we would have to bang away 25,000 feature films a second. We had some people from Hollywood when the uh, Angels and Demons film was filmed both here in Rome and at CERN, and we, I had the pleasure of taking a, one of a Hollywood reporter from Vanity, you know, these guys. Anyway, let's not go into that. And I mentioned that we are producing 25, we would need to produce 25 DVD equivalent a second. So she looked at me and said, gee, guys, I didn't know that you were in the movie business. And I said, I don't want to use this as a bad example. But just to give you an idea, since you're in the media industry, 25,000 DVDs. If anybody in the room knows how to produce 25,000 DVDs a second, please stand up, because we would like to exchange business cards. No. All right. So what we can do, we can, we can, we can produce a DVD equivalent of data about uh, 8 to 10 seconds. Okay? That we can do. But we do it, of course, on a continuous basis. So that turns out that the data flow is about 320 megabytes per second. Now, that may not sound shocking because your internet connection is around 50 to uh, about 100 megabytes per second if you live in a, in a very densely populated area. But remember, this is constant speed. And remember, we are doing this days after nights, after months, after years. So in one year, we produce about data which would fit about 3 million DVDs. So you guys who like to watch films, that's about 550 years of watching nice films in one year. So that's where the big data comes from. 
And as I said, we are looking for one specific small signal. So let me illustrate that using the Higgs. Everybody has heard about the Higgs? So let me show you. Here's a graph that shows the actual data that we collected. So all the black dots that you see in the picture, this is real physical data. You can see in the upper right corner, clock running. So this is about a year's time that we use in this specific picture. And the axis, the, the, uh, the vertical axis gives, the, if you like, the quality of the signal. And the, and the horizontal axis gives you the mass, the weight of the Higgs. Remember, we are obsessed with this question, what is mass, what is weight? And here you see, and the, look at the blue line. So the blue line in this picture is the background. This is what we basically, it's a, a very sophisticated scientific term for saying noise. We don't want to know about the noise. Noise comes with all this data. And what we want to find out is, is there a deviation from the noise? And in this picture, you can see, can you see a little blip? It's uh, in red. It's around 125, 126 energy units, mass units. I hope you can see it, because if you can't see it, then we are in deep trouble. Yeah, I'm sure you can see it. There's a little blip there in the halfway of that screen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the Higgs. It took 50 years to find that thing. That's big data. So when you are excited about big data, remember, it's one thing to collect it, it's, but it's the second thing to, to, to know what to do with it. All right. OK, now, Charlie asked me to tell you how did we do this from an organizational point of view. So that's a long story. Uh, it took us tens of years. So let me try to summarize it in very simple terms. There are three factors, we believe, that makes this work. First is vision. By the way, we never use the word vision. It's sort of really for external folks that we use this word. But what vision means, I hope you already understood. This is the big picture. This is the questions that we ask ourselves, which really make a difference. This is order of magnitude thinking. Some of you would like to say, oh, it's kind of out of the box thinking. Yeah, maybe. But these are really order of magnitude problems. We are not interested in tinkering version 1.1 to 1.2. We want to go from version 1.1 to 10.1 or 100.1. So there's a re real kind of leap in, in technology, in science, in, in, even in our understanding of, of the universe. So that's really important. Second is commitment. Our folks are really like ants. They, we are an ant community. We are a we community, not an I community, but a we community. So we work very hard. We work for decades. As I said, it took about 50 years to find the Higgs. I came to CERN in 1980, 1918, 1985 to look for the Higgs, and we just found it last year. So just to give you a little illustration that in this business, one has to be very, very, very patient and committed. And the last is tolerance. Now, I'm not referring to technical tolerance. I'm really referring to tolerance in terms of allowing people to be different. Now, see here, which is very nice. I kind of feel very comfortable being here because I see a lot of you very casually dressed. Now, I know that I may not be all true behind, but anyway, you look very relaxed like we do at CERN. Albeit, you are better dressed than we are. This is a community that accepts tolerance, and I guess your community is like that. So we like divergence. Divergence is OK. Ambiguity is OK. You know, companies are very good in putting everything in a box very quickly and cutting the, uh, or actually reducing the, uh, the uncertainty up front. That doesn't work well in our business. Companies want to go binary very quickly, so they start with a project and it's, you know, either it will succeed or it will not succeed. We would never enter into a situation like that. We keep our options open. So we keep our options open as long as we can. Then, of course, time and money will force us to converge. But in the beginning, we like diversity. We love diversity. It's really important for us. It's a bit like a, a raw diamond that, you know, you look at a raw diamond, it doesn't look very fancy. But when you have, you know, 6,000 people looking at it and say, oh, you know, it's kind of cute and I would like to do this and, you know, let me polish it a little bit. Suddenly, over time, it turns into a, a shiny diamond. And that's what the process of science is all about. So we are global. This is the experiment I'm now talking about, Atlas, but it doesn't matter. There are three others, exactly the same story. So the sun never sets in this, this environment. Thousands of PhD students. Uh, we have, in one experiment alone, about three or 4,000 people. So if you add that up, the whole total community linked to LHC alone is about 10,000 people. And this is what we do. This is the detector that I showed you in pictures. But of course, what really counts are the people behind it. 
And behind the people, there are stories. I, I don't have the time to go to, into these stories. I know you guys like stories. We don't make stories for the media. We make stories for ourselves about what is important, why we want to do it. And this is a very effective way of sharing the culture of, of the we. Anyway, the govern governance the way we do this is very, very simple. So we have basically a seven-page document, which we call the Memorandum of Understanding. The participating governments sign it. And on the top of the document, on the front page, it says not a legally binding document, which is kind of interesting, because it's based on a best effort basis. Each country participate with the best effort. The institutes, the, the scientists behind, will do their best, but nobody's going to be judged or, you know, we will work together. We will make sure that everybody delivers. And the structure is really uh, like a potluck party or a picnic party, so that everybody, we give them a shopping list of this is what the detector will consist of. Everybody chips in. There is some loose coordination, but there's not a management. In this business, you will not find one person who leads the thing. There's no CEO in our business. Uh, I'll try to show that to you in a moment. Okay, I think I've said everything I needed to say. If you look at the organization chart, those of you who like organization charts, this is a very non-meaningful chart. What it basically says is that there is a collaboration board up to the left corner seen from you, which consists of all the institutes. They decide together the policies for publication and research strategies and so on. To the right, there's a red box. This is where the governments uh, sit and look at the financial um, resources being used. And then below, you have a small management team. Again. I would like to emphasize this is a coordination body rather than a, a sort of a CEO structured uh, company structure. There's, this is more like arbitration. There is a spokesperson in an experiment, and he or she may have three colleagues. So I used to be the resources coordinator for the last 12 years. And then below, you have the specific subsystems. And this is sort of a very flat structure. Now. The computing I mentioned earlier, to get all this computing done, we can't do it all at CERN, so we distribute it. So we have over 10 countries where we send the data. It leaves from CERN, it goes to these centers, and then it's being crunched there. It takes about 48 hours for the events to be analyzed, and then it comes back to CERN where we then analyze it in more detail. And the structure along the computing goes bit like in the experiments, in the physical experiments I just showed to you in a moment. So when you look at these little blobs here, they give you an indication of the type of technologies that are needed for distributed computing. We call this the grid, but you folks probably know it better as cloud computing. It's the same thing. And it started from uh, the LHC. Well, we don't want to take credit all along because we are working, as I said earlier, part of a larger community, but we are very closely connected. The grid has been used now in many, many other fields, and in other fields of sciences, also in business. I don't know if in your business, but certainly in many. And again, I'd like to emphasize that the point is that it's the way you use these resources that counts. And exactly like in the case of the accelerator and, and the experiments, it is also a, a sort of bottom up. There's not one guy who's leading it, it's a community. I would not be surprised if a major scientific or technological breakthrough will be done in the future by a Facebook or Instagram group that gets itself organized. And each member is putting their own little contribution uh, into this, or small one. Uh, and these people don't have to be in one physical place, and they certainly don't need to be scientists. Why do I believe that? If you look from our point of view, uh, the policy that we have in the LHC is that anybody who contributes to the project will get his or her name in the publications. So here's an example of a, a physics publication. It has about 3,000 names in this specific case. So the first 24 pages are names of the participants, and then about five or six pages actually about the physics. Now, my name is there. It's uh, on page, <laughs> I don't know, 20, all right? And you might ask, what is the motivation, for example, for me to participate? Was I told by my management? Marcus, you have to go and find the Higgs. No. Did they ask me to do it? Yeah, they did it. So why did I go? Well, I did it because I was really interested in contributing in my little way what I was doing. I was paying bills. I was nowhere close to the Higgs chart. Let's be very clear about that. But that contribution was, accept was accepted by the community. And I want to remind you again, this is a bottom-up approach. So the community consists of the people who participate in it. 
and they agreed that my little contribution is worth getting my name on this journal. So what it means is that not only the physics, but also the administration part, the resources part, count. And that's a fundamental point. This goes beyond our business, of course, is science, and so we have to produce publications, but that goes much beyond that. This is about individual passion, I think, to contribute to a fundamental problem which we have. Now, let's go back to the Higgs and let me explain from a personal perspective why this was so important to me. Now, without the Higgs, we would not be here. We would not be in this room. You have to thank Peter Higgs for existing because the Higgs mechanism gives us mass. If there wasn't a Higgs particle, we would not be in this room. We would not exist. We would be probably part of the light that comes from the night sky. But we're here. We're sitting right here. So we exist. There is a fundamental connection between our existence, between us, and the stuff, this invisible stuff that is here but we can't see. Maybe there are people in this audience who would like to participate in understanding what it is and maybe participate in contributing something to it. I certainly do. Because, because this is what the big picture is all about. And this is what big data is all about. Thank you. <laughs>